Hey, music junkies, professor of rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. Make sure to subscribe below, hit the bell so you never miss out on our daily content, be a part of this community. You can also check out our Patreon link where you get more content and help us keep this music alive. You can't change the past, so don't let it haunt you. You can change the future, but first you gotta want to. Words of wisdom from the diminutive rock icon with the gigantic voice, the incomparable Pat Benatar. The Pat Benatar's rise to stardom is a narrative of relentless pursuit. It's a heartwarming story of romantic alchemy. I mean, once Pat Benatar knew what she wanted, she was fearless, scratching and clawing her way to becoming one of the most influential artists of the rock and roll era. And it was obvious to everyone that came in contact with uh, young Patricia May Andreuski that she was something very special. She grew up in the Greenpoint neighborhood of Brooklyn, New York, and her father was a sheet metal worker. Her mother was a beautician. She was also a trained opera singer, and Pat's mother exposed her young daughter to classical music and the beloved standards of the great American songbook. And Pat received voice lessons she actually sang her first solo at eight years of age during a musical production at Daniel Street Elementary. She left the attendees in awe of her precocious ability. She also trained as a coloratura uh, in high school with aspirations of attending Juilliard School. Before her life took a detour and she decided to attend Stony Brook University in Long Island to study health education with aspirations of becoming a school teacher. After high school, Pat married her high school sweetheart, Dennis Benatar, and it appeared that she was on the same path as her mother. She was gonna settle into a life of domesticity. Dennis Benatar had joined the army, and while Dennis was stationed at Fort Lee Army Base in Virginia, Pat worked as a teller at a bank near the base. Man, I'd love to hear from someone who remembers Pat Benatar helping them with a transaction. Can you imagine? In 73, Pat had an epiphany when she attended a Liza Minnelli concert in Richmond, Virginia. Pat was so inspired by Minnelli's performance that she decided to quit the bank and move full speed ahead to establish a career as a singer. In Richmond, Pat was the lead vocalist for a popular lounge band named Coxon's Army. The group was starting to get some traction when Pat lowered the boom and told her bandmates that she was leaving the band to go back to New York to pursue a solo career, no matter how far-fetched it seemed. Benatar came to the realization that in order to build a successful career in the music business, she needed to challenge authority. She needed to break rules and disrupt her harmless domestic life. In 1975, Pat packed her belongings into her Honda Civic. She left for New York with $2,500 and whatever she could stuff into that Civic. Her husband, Dennis, joined her in New York after he was discharged from the army. Now, the people that she left behind in Richmond, they told her that she was crazy, that she would be back, definitely be back. But of course they underestimated Pat. She wanted to change the future and never look back. With the power of conviction, there is no sacrifice. Another golden mantra to follow from Pat Benatar. In 1976, Pat scored a role in the late Harry Chapin's futuristic rock musical, The Zinger, that ran for four weeks at the Performing Arts Foundation Playhouse in Long Island. Always a flair for the dramatic, Pat participated in a costume contest on Halloween night in 77 at Cafe Figaro in Greenwich Village in New York. She dressed as a character from the sci-fi B-movie, Cat Women of the Moon, clad in a skin-tight cat suit. After the contest, she went on stage for the Catch a Falling Star Comedy Club, still wearing that spandex costume. The crowd loved it. They loved her, and it led to additional gigs, including being hired to sing jingles for Pepsi Cola. In the spring of 1978, Pat was asked to perform at the famed nightclub Tramps in New York City, where she was discovered by Terry Ellis, the head of Chrysalis Records. Ellis, of course, a music industry heavyweight who had a knack for identifying artists with huge potential, megastars like Huey Lewis, Billy Idol, and Blondie. It was an amazing connection for Pat Benatar that led to her being signed to Chrysalis. 
When Pat met with the executives at her new label, she explained that artist uh, that she wanted to be. She told them exactly who she wanted to be. She conveyed a vision of representing a hard rock sound with a, a female front person that could compete with the male rockers, filling arenas, selling massive amounts of records. It was something that was frankly unheard of during that time, especially when disco reigned supreme and it had never really been done on a major scale by a solo female artist. Many people at the label were skeptical, telling Pat, among other neghead comments, uh, that she didn't have the right look. Making her first album on Chrysalis got off to a rough start with a team of New York City session players that the label enlisted. Although the musicians were technically competent, Pat felt the unit of the label assembled for her had no soul and no passion. She got increasingly worried and despondent. Chrysalis then turned to veteran Mike Chapman to produce and navigate, as he has done with countless other acts, including Susie Quattro, another great female power that happened uh, before that. Chapman totally put the project on the right track. Uh, one of the first moves that Chapman made was to bring in a collaborator, someone that shared Pat's vision for the new record. Pat followed Chapman's suggestion to enlist a talented musician named Neil Giraldo, who was a member of Rick Derringer's band. Giraldo was an incredible guitarist and multi-instrumentalist with a sixth sense feel for the intangibles that just give songs passion and purpose. He was exactly what Pat was missing personally and professionally. In 1979, Pat and Dennis split up, first husband. In spite of the divorce, Pat retained her Benatar surname to keep her stage persona that she had worked so hard to build. Meanwhile, there was instant chemistry, artistically and physically, between Pat and Neil. The couple became romantically involved and developed an inseparable bond. Pat had found her muse and her soulmate. Pat and Neil, uh, whom Pat affectionately nicknamed Spider, were married in 82, and they're still together today. It's one of the all-time great rock and roll love stories. The Benatar Geraldo Chapman collaboration created a dynamic, invigorating debut album in the heat of the night, released in 1979. The album sold over a million copies. The first single from the album, the cover of the British band Smokey's uh, If You Think You Know How to Love Me, that stiffed. Nervously, Chrysalis turned to the Jeff Gill and Cliff Wade penned Heartbreaker as the second single, a song originally written for and recorded by England's Jenny Darren in 78, but nothing really notable happened with her version. The tandem of Benatar and Geraldo gave the track a fiery overhaul and it turned into a walloping rocker that broke the pop music mold and it rose to number 23 on the Billboard Hot 100. It was Pat Benatar's breakthrough single to set up a decade of dominance at radio, MTV, the concert, box office, and in pop culture. Pat Benatar's career vision became a reality. She became the premier female front person, breaking barriers and inspiring an I can do it trailblazer mentality for a new generation of artists. She thrived with intrepid vigilance, uh, coining another tenet to govern her career, demand respect, and give it back. You have the power. Overall, Pat Benatar released six platinum albums and scored 15 top 40 hits on the Billboard Hot 100. She was the first female artist to receive heavy exposure on MTV. She won the Best Female Vocal Grammy Award four consecutive years, 81, 82, 83, and 84. She holds the record along with Tina Turner and Sheryl Crow for most wins in that category. Pat Benatar is not only an icon as a rock maverick, she's also a pop culture icon. Whether it was her skin tight leggings, her headbands, or her short pixie style haircut, women around the world wanted to look just like Pat Benatar. Linda, that girl looks just like Pat Benatar. I know. Wait, there are three girls here at Ridgemont who have cultivated the Pat Benatar look. Janelle's Having said that, here is my Pat Benatar fiver. First, my honorable mention, Shadows of the Night from the fourth Pat Benatar studio album, Get Nervous. Shadows of the Night was originally submitted for the 1980 movie Times Square by its composer, Dale Bryan, but it was never used in the film. It was also rejected by Arista Records as not being commercial enough when Bryan tried to get the label to release it as a single from his solo album on Arista. We're with the 
Uh, the second go around for Shadows of the Night was when American singer Helen Schneider made it a platinum hit in Germany. But uh, the most famous interpretation is when Pat Benatar recorded a fresh Neil Giraldo arrangement of the track with her amazing vocal. Just grabs you immediately from that cold intro. Her performance on Shadows of the Night won a Grammy for Best Female Rock Vocal in 1983. The track climbed to number 13 on the Billboard Hot 100 in 82, went to number 3 on the mainstream rock charts, and number 12 in Canada. Number 5 from 1980, Hit Me With Your Best Shot. Arguably the song that Pat Benatar is most associated with. Now, Pat once famously quipped, and I quote, Most chick singers say, if you hurt me, I'll die. I say, if you hurt me, I'll kick your ass. End of quote. That Pat Benatar attitude punches you right square in the nose on Hit Me With Your Best Shot with face-melting guitar work by Neil Giraldo. The song written by Eddie Schwartz, who also penned The Doctor by the Doobie Brothers, and Don't Shed a Tear by Paul Carrick. Great song. Uh, that's become an arena rock standard. It was the second single that was released from Pat's second album, Crimes of Passion, and Pat's first top 10 single. It hit number nine on the Billboard Hot 100 and number 10 in Canada. And her voice on that song, just incredible. Number four, Invincible, the Grammy-nominated single that was the first release off of Pat's number six studio album, Seven the Hard Way. We It was also used as the theme song for the 1985 film, The Legend of Billie Jean, starring Helen Slater. To have a huge crush on her, who didn't? Here's how the song was written and presented to Pat and Neil by the tune's primary lyricist, Holly Knight. It's one of my favorite songs that I've written. Like if I were to tell you like my top five, that is definitely one of them, because I like the way the melody jumps around. And going back to what I was saying, Pat is the kind of singer that no matter what I wrote for her, she could nail it. She did an incredible vocal on that. And I loved the video too. And I didn't know this, but she was actually four months pregnant when she was doing the video. She was wearing a very <laughs> large coat, but she looked beautiful. So then it was in the movie, it came out and it, and it did really well on the radio and everything. Invincible was another top 10 smash for Pat Benatar, number 10 on the Billboard Hot 100, number four on the mainstream rock charts, and number six in Canada. Number three, Hell is for Children, a choice cut from the blockbuster 1980 LP, Crimes of Passion. Hell is for Children is not just a cool album track. It is a, a Benatar Geraldo rock manifesto. Co-written by Pat and Neil, the song is about the evil of child abuse, the, the cryptic effort by the perpetrators to cover it up, and the irreparable harm that it does to the children. Pat's powerful voice in Hell is for Children roars with outrage, commanding justice for the unfortunate victims of child abuse, and a call to action to stop these atrocities, because hell, hell is for children. Hell is for children. And you know that their little lives can become such a mess. Hell, hell is for children, and you shouldn't have to pay for your love with your bones and your flesh. Benatar unleashes all the disdain and fury for the indefensible evil like an unstoppable crusader. And Geraldo rips the guts out of the guitar on a roaring solo through the song's coda like an avenging superhero. It's a, a lethal attack that makes you want to take matters into your own hands to protect our children. I love how the song demonstrates the impact of the Benatar Geraldo artistic partnership. Hell is for Children is one of the most potent musical compositions of social commentary that I've ever heard. Number two, We Belong, the lead single for Top 40 Radio Play from Tropico in 84. Now, on any other day, this would be my number one. Um, now, we all know that Pat can belt out a vocal that goes far beyond her petite frame. That's a fact. But We Belong demonstrates her sweet versatility. To give you up that easy, to the doubts of On this song, it's like she's going back to her young roots when she used to captivate audiences by singing a Judy Garland number. Her vocals here are just 
absolutely transfixing. Pat sings We Belong, a tell about a woman trying to rise above petty differences to save a relationship with the perfect blend of sensitivity and emphasis. Whatever we deny or embrace, for worse or for better, we belong, we belong, we belong together. Man. We Belong was co-written by Eric Lowen and Dan Navarro. The song begins with the unique effect of a soft synthesizer simulating the sound of a stringed instrument being plucked simultaneously. The drum track, oh, the drum track, performed by Myron Grombacher, um, creates a rhythmic unity that harmonizes the theme of the song with a subtle yet motivating cadence. It's just so mesmerizing. Myron performed on nine Benatar albums, and like Neil Giraldo was a recruit from the Rick Derringer band, We Belong was one of Pat Benatar's biggest hits. Number five on the Billboard Hot 100, number three on the Mainstream Rock Chart, number eight in Canada, number seven in Australia and New Zealand. It's no surprise this was a huge hit. It's such a feel-good song. It's one of those classic 80s songs that will live on forever because it defines the era that it came from. It's just a perfect song. Especially this part. And the power in that last chorus, it just threads the needle of the soul. Now, before we go to the number one spot, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, the glasses I'm wearing. I'm wearing the red and black here. This is Professor Rock on the side. You can design your own pair at the link below. These are amazing. Um, you can also get sunglasses, blue blockers. Hit the link below to deliver them right to you. And number one, love is a battlefield. This song represents everything that we love about Pat Benatar. Her ability to communicate to her audience with that towering voice, inspiring strength, and empowerment for all types of human beings. Love is a Battlefield was actually not written by Pat or Neil, but they took a Holly Knight, Mike Chapman collaboration and they turned it into a rebellious battle cry. Now here's co-author Holly Knight with some of the story. I had the chords to the, the song in my head already. I just sat down and I started playing them to Mike. And then we just started to play on that. And that became like the nucleus of the, of the chorus, the, you know, the... We are young, heartache too hard. Okay, so we were mumbling phonetically stuff like that, but then we sat down, we started, you know, putting down some lyrics, and Mike said, you know what? This is a hit. He said, but we need to, we need to come up with like a really strange title. He said, because otherwise it's just going to be just a nice commercial thing. So we need to mix it up like, you know, maybe write something even a little twisted, you know? I said, like, like what? And he goes, hmm, I have no fucking clue. <laughs> <laughs> and then he goes, and then he starts pacing the floor. And he's going, this is like a wild animal. He's pacing the floor, like grabbing his head. And, and I can see he's like about to give birth to something. He goes, I don't know. He says something. He goes, well, not like this, but something that would be weird like this. And he goes, love is a battlefield. And I went, what? I said, that's great. Let's use it. And I said, um, I don't really know what it means. He says, who cares? We'll figure it out when we write it. You like it? Let's do it. Let's write the thing song. And so we started to bring the song together. It came together beautifully. We wrote that entire song that day, but for one line. And we'll definitely do a deep dive on this song down the road. This is definitely one of those songs that should have been number one. Love is a Battlefield fought all the way to number five on the Billboard Hot 183. It was number one on the mainstream rock chart. It was number two in Canada, number one in the Netherlands and Australia. Love is a battlefield. The music video for Love is a Battlefield was one of the most memorable ever played on MTV. It was also the first music video created with actual dialogue. Are you kidding me? We are you leave this house now. Pat Benatar was so rad. I remember staying up late to watch this on Friday night videos, just transfixed by the television, begged my mom to record it on the VCR, in which she did, and I watched it just over and over again. How many times have you repeated this dialogue? We are young. <laughs> we are young. Hi.
The video is brilliantly directed by Bob Giraldi, choreographed by Michael Peters. Pat Benatar epitomizes the exhilarating force of the music. She's only five feet tall, but she has the heart and soul of Mount Everest. Her story of the ascension as an artist that's sure to be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is just so inspirational. She should already be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Her romance novel of how she found her spider restores our faith that there is such a thing as true love. I wish we had more happy endings like this real life ballad of Pat and Neil. Here at Professor of Rock, I want to inaugurate Pat Benatar as the governess of rock and roll. Leave us a comment about Pat and her song. What is your fiver? What are your memories tied to these songs? If you like this segment, you're gonna like our other ones. You'll wanna subscribe below. Make sure to get Pat's music below at our Amazon links. Join our Patreon for so much more content to help us keep the music alive. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Hey.